A uh, brief background on aerial services for some of those, uh, some of you who might not know. Um, we have we provide uh, lidar and photogrammetry services to clients all around the country in forestry and transmission pipeline rail businesses around the country using both fixed wing and rotary aircraft. We've been flying large manned aircraft for um, over 45 years. We're out of uh, Cedar Falls, Iowa, right in smack dead center of the country. And I anticipate that in the near future, it is highly likely that we'll be operating perhaps dozens of unmanned vehicles using a much greater variety of sensors than we currently use today. This is how compelling unmanned system technology really is. We've also been working the last year or so in partnership with the University of Northern Iowa flying a small unmanned system. Um, I've established three um, certificates of authorization with the FAA here in Iowa so we can fly that bird. And I write about UAS technology and its exciting implications for our society, profession, and various journals around the planet. I'm an enthusiast for this technology because I understand its amazing potential. I believe that UAS is, is not simply another tool with which we'll be doing remote sensing. Its implications for geospatial are much broader than that. So with that, Kevin, could you uh, introduce yourself and give a brief background of what you're up to? Sure. Well, first, uh, thank you, Mike and um, for this opportunity to, uh, to talk about these issues, and thank you to, to Amy for putting this together. Uh, I am Kevin Pomfret. I'm the executive, founder and executive director for the Center for Spatial Law and Policy, which is a nonprofit, global, membership-based organization that's been focusing for the past few years on the legal and policy issues that impact the collection, the use, the storage, and the, and the distribution of, of geo-information. Um, Obviously, these are um, you know, UAVs are an important issue and have becoming increasingly subject to scrutiny from lawmakers and regulators uh, because some of the things that we'll talk about today. So I think it's a very timely discussion. I agree with Mike. I think it's a very important discussion because its impact is is the potential impact of UAVs is is very significant, and many of the folks on the call here today can do some incredible things with it, but there are some legitimate and, and frankly some probably overstated concerns that, that need to be addressed as, as we move forward. Uh, so uh, I look forward to this discussion. Yeah, and I just encourage everybody that's uh, listening to the webinar today, please uh, submit your questions. We plan to have plenty of time to talk about them, and as important as this issue is, um, um, we want to try to get to those questions and to have a, a, as much of a dialogue with the audience as we can. So with that said, there's, there's certainly no doubt that uh, the nation and much of the world is excited to de today about the prospect of commercial drone use. It's hard to get through a day or a week and not hear something about drones in the news. Their potential contribution to the society and the economy is huge. For example, uh, the Association of Unmanned Vehicle Systems International released a economic study a year or so ago and uh, um, estimated that just over three years, once commercial um, use is allowed, they could see a growth of $13.6 billion um, in the economy from this activity and uh, create 70,000 direct and indirect jobs, and frankly, I think those estimates are low, but we'll see. And so as geospatial professionals, we certainly recognize this great potential, but at the same time, it is to our own demise that we ignore or whitewash the problems or threats to privacy incumbent with unmanned vehicles. And we need to discuss these issues. We've got a We've got to put them in perspective. Uh, hopefully, we'll influence regulation along the way. And, and just as importantly, all of us as professional geospatial practitioners should demonstrate a level of competence and professionalism and a sensitivity of others' privacy. Um, it's, drones will be abused and misused, just like any technology. 
but their overall positive contribution to society will far outweigh their negative impact. They've already aroused a number of legitimate and illegitimate privacy concerns. So Kevin, can you describe some of these issues surrounding drones and privacy and, and orient us to how we got to the place we find ourselves today with these issues? Sure. So I think it's important to start out to recognize, in starting out to recognize that the discussion around UAVs and privacy really needs to be considered in part of a larger context regarding privacy in general. And we'll discuss this a little bit in more detail a little bit later. But particularly with respect from a location standpoint, we're struggling to define what is a reasonable expectation of privacy given today's technology. And has that expectation changed? And should how should laws and policies and regulations reflect that change? So when we talk about UAVs today, we need to sort of keep that in mind. And I think the next two slides will help explain what I, what I see happening, which is something that I start to call a, a privacy paradox. So here we have an image or a picture taken from 2005 in St. Peter's Square in connection with Pope John Paul II's funeral procession. And you can just see a large number of people just looking down the square uh, waiting for, um, uh, to, to view the procession go by. If you go to the next slide, which is only eight years later, this is the same perspective in St. Peter's Square in connection with Pope Francis's election as the Pope. And I describe this as a privacy paradox, because what we ha see here are more devices, more people using devices to collect, publish, share, and um, memorialize their location. But at the same time, they're much more concerned about privacy in 2013 than they were back in 2005. I, I'm pretty sure that most of those people there in 2005 weren't concerned about who was doing what with their information, but now in 2013, it's one of the, the major discussions going to take place. So I think this highlights what I call the privacy paradox, and in a relatively short period of time, particularly with respect to US history, this is what we're dealing with, and the legal and policy communities have not been able to keep up. So if you go to the next slide and look at what we're looking at from the FAA standpoint, there's a number of different layers, <coughs> excuse me, of regulation or potential legislation and regulation that could impact the UAV community. Now the FAA is not typically considered a government agency with a mission to protect privacy or civil liberties, but partly due to instructions or a mandate that it was given by Congress to figure out how to include F UAVs into the national airspace, it selected six test sites to um, work on some of the operational issues involved. And as part of that, they are requiring these sites to develop publicly available privacy policies, subject to fair information practice principles that we'll discuss later, and then allow for the feedback to provide feedback on that. So they're hoping, and they actually are required, to use these test sites to develop an informed dialogue on privacy issues. So that's one step of potential regulation that UAV operators need to consider. The next is the, next is, the uh, is the Federal Trade Commission, which is the next, the next slide, please. All right, there you go. So the, the Federal Trade Commission is not specifically tied to UAVs, but it does have broad authority under Section 5 of the, Federal, the, the Act that created it to protect privacy in general. And they have increasingly started to look at location privacy as something that they're concerned about. Now, initially, this has come out because of location privacy with respect to mobile devices and the ability to determine location there. But they've started to broaden that to other devices, intelligence transportation systems, the smart grids, and, and even, um, although they have not directly related, directly talked about using this with respect to UAVs, I think you can expect as high resolution imagery is developed or is, is in the marketplace on UAVs that the FTC is going to be taking a look at what are the privacy implications as they try to protect uh, consumer privacy. So that's another layer of regulation that the executive level will need to consider. Okay. Another set of issues that we can consider we should be considering is at the federal level is, is Congress. There has been legislation attempted to deal with the issue of UAVs and privacy. There was the Farmers Privacy Act back in 2012. 
There's been more recently the Drone Aircraft Privacy and Transparency Act. And I think I could, I don't think there's been much progress on any of these in terms of actually becoming law. But I think you can continue. You'll continue to see efforts within Congress to deal with these issues, partly because it, it's such a bipartisan issue. Concerns over privacy in UAVs, particularly with re regards to use by government agencies, are on both sides of the aisle. So there's a great deal of interest in at least discussing this issue. Uh, and, and I think it's one thing to consider as we go forward is what is the difference between a drone, a satellite, and a manned aircraft from a privacy standpoint. In one way, they're all simply a platform for sensors. So one concern that I would have is as you start to regulate drones and the information that's collected, how does that start to impact other types of platforms that collect information? Another area to consider are state legislatures. So there are a number of states, a number of bills have been introduced in almost all states to deal with UAVs or UASs. Uh, many of these bills were privacy related and, and most didn't go anywhere. But legislation did pass in 13 states. They can really be, th those that pass can be contributed to or can be put into sort of two categories. One dealing with law enforcement or government agencies' use of information, and the other is private collection use of UAVs to collect information. And I think it's important to consider what are those limitations in terms of how private parties can use uh, UAVs. And for instance, in Texas, there were 19 specific exemptions as to the prohibition on the private use of UAVs, whereas in Idaho, there's an exemption for mapping and ex inspecting own facilities. Now, mapping isn't defined. So because of the power of geolocation information, one person's mapping could be another person's surveillance or used for another, another purpose. So we need to sort of consider that as you look at state legislation. And then in Oregon, which is the third state where it was passed, it limited UAVs flying less than 400 feet above an owner's property if you've been instructed to pass. So this is a state. Mike, I think this is your, your slide. Well, yeah, uh, uh, comp uh, we thank uh, maps for this graphic, but basically it just summarizes what you just said as far as the, the states that have had uh, laws or regulations introduced, passed, or defeated, or haven't acted on them yet. And it goes to your point that both sides of the aisle are concerned about this issue, and there's lots of activity at the federal and state level over unmanned aerial systems, and they generally relate to privacy and what our expectations as the public are as to how our state and federal government will um, apply this technology. I, th I think something else to consider, Mike, is that there is something called a, a tort, which is a, a private right of action for a harm that has been uh, that someone has in, has inf has received from another individual, uh, for instance, trespass or intrusion upon seclusion or public disclosure of private facts. These are all torts in common states that have them, and it's not all the states. But you can see in the future individuals maybe bringing a lawsuit against uh, someone who flies a UAV and claim that they've been tr trespassed or there's been a public disclosure of private facts, if that's a common law tort in a particular jurisdiction. So even in states where there aren't these regulations, it is important to keep in mind that there are other potential claims. And in fact, courts will have an important say going forward, particularly before legislatures catch up, as to what the law is, will be, or, or is likely to be. So that's another area we should, we should consider as UAVs become more, more popular. So, Kevin, are torts just legal decisions made by some court in some jurisdiction about some issue? And therefore, they have precedent um, and govern behavior, or what? I, I mean, that's a, that's a good way to describe it. It's a, it's a common law, it's, it's a court's decision on saying that someone has been injured and what the recourse is. So, for instance, a lot of in a lot of jurisdiction, there's there's trespass is an example of a tort. If there's not a specific statute or regulation, you still may not be able to trespass onto someone's property. Uh, and if you did so, someone could bring a, a an action against you in court, and the judge could fine you, or um, you know, 
put other sanctions upon you. So the question then becomes, well, when does UAV use around a person's private property constitute a trespass? Is it when it's above, uh, when it's below the, the roof level, or is it if it's 24-7 and it's making a loud noise, or if it prevents the, the use of the uh, enjoyment of the property? Those are, those are examples that courts may be looking at before legislatures are able to address. Yeah, I see. Okay. And they okay, good. Um, so these concerns over privacy uh, seem to stem from our expectation of, you know, civil liberties at some level. So a couple questions. First, what are the core constitutional issues related to privacy and unmanned vehicles? Uh, but more importantly, can you describe how these constitutional concerns apply and don't apply to the civil and commercial domain? So the, so the Fourth Amendment, uh, which you have up on the, the slide right now, is, is the common uh, constitutional right that is, that, is, that is raised with respect to the UAVs and the government's use. And I think it's important to recognize that the Fourth Amendment applies to the federal government's use of uh, collecting information that's considered an unreasonable search or seizure with, with, without getting a warrant. And the, 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 the question that becomes, and I raised this earlier, is what is the reasonable expectation of privacy of a particular individual that the government is not going to create a, a search or, or seize their property? And, seize, and searches and seizures have become very broadly defined to include collecting information about people's homes or what's going on inside or from their telephone calls and it's been applied to a lot of scenarios. So in this particular case I think we can look at historically the remote sensing, take, uh, taking images of people in public places were not considered to be an unreasonable search and seizure that required a warrant and there's a series of cases, the Dow Chemical case in Florida v. Riley that have looked at this with respect to aircraft or with respect to helicopters, and by implication it was assumed that it would be with satellites. So the general assumption was that you could collect information, the government could collect information on individuals and use that in court and not violate their Fourth Amendment if they were in a public space. And so you would assume that you know, as long as UAVs were not peeking inside homes or collecting information, other, other types of information that were not readily observable, that you, could, you would be okay. But the law is starting to change, and the most recent case is the case called U.S. v. Jones, which doesn't have to do with remote sensing. It had to do with law enforcement's use of a GPS tracking device and in a public space, and historically that has been assumed to be okay, but in the U.S. v. Jones case that was settled just a year or so ago, a majority of justices seem to suggest that if you collect information of an individual over a long period of time, you could violate their Fourth Amendment rights. And the, 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 the issue then becomes, what is that period of time? And that's even if they're in a public space. So even if they're in a public space, if you get enough information, you could violate their Fourth Amendment rights unless you get a warrant. By implication, you could see the similar type rules being applied to UAVs or other remote sensing. Now, that has not been tested, and again, it would only apply to the federal government and not to commercial enterprises. But it is something to sort of keep in mind because it does, again, create sort of the framework of what people's expectation of privacy is. And then courts and states and other legislatures sort of look to that as they build their laws and policies. So that could have some relevance to um, the federal government putting a persistent um, UAV over some city and, and videotaping it for, you know, a week solid or a month solid or something like that. It, it could. Um, I think it, it right now, oh, I, that it, it could also have more relevance about putting it over someone's home and then following their car when they, wherever they drive or a series of, of people. Uh, yeah. But you could also see it applying to putting it over a, a city and, and sort of collecting information that could identify an individual and monitor the movement on an on extended basis for a long period of time that there would be a number of people that would that would be concerned about that yeah. and would raise the Fourth Amendment concerns. So you were going to also kind of I think it, uh, bring us up to speed on how we got to where we're at today as far as 
privacy issues in general and drones specifically? Yeah, so, so one of the thoughts is probably if you were to say in a crowd of 100 people get use the word UAV, you would probably get 98 different perceptions in people's mind as to what they're thinking about. But a lot of them uh, would, in general, some would be considering sort of targeted killings as one of the things that drones would, could be used for. And that's partly because we tend to have associated the use of drones, at least in the U.S., to the military's use of targeted killings in places across the world. Um, and it, it's important to sort of keep in mind that one of the concerns about drones is when you see one flying overhead, you really don't know what's on it. And we haven't tried to deal with that much here in the U.S., but certainly people overseas had to deal with it. And so you can see people being concerned about what, who's using it, how they're using it, what are they going to do with it, and is it, is it even for me? So we can, we can certainly understand, we, we can debate as to whether these concerns are justified or not, but I think we do have to recognize that for a lot of people, UAVs are associated with weaponized or other types of things that, that are, are concerning to people if they don't really understand. Another aspect of that, obviously, is the recent revelations about the NSA and domestic spying, or just the collection of information domestically and, in, and abroad on, on U.S. citizens. Um, again, the UAV debate is part of a much larger privacy debate, and the recent revelations about the U.S. collecting information either directly or indirectly through companies are adding to these concerns, and these concerns get pushed back to legislatures, policymakers, uh, and, and judges, um, as do as, as this slide shows, and, and I'll have to credit Mike for this. I think it's a great, great slide about how you, what you need to do to protect your passwords and your identity. But it sort of highlights a lot of the media reports about uh, data breaches and personally identifiable information being stolen and weak passwords that allow people to come in and to take your information. We are giving so much information. We have been for a number of years. And now people are starting to worry about the concerns that this has, particularly as it relates to companies such as Facebook that are doing all these things that people don't even understand as to how it's going on. And so when they read reports about privacy and media concerns and how you can be identified and how you can be tracked, you put that on top of the issues about targeting and UAVs in general, and you get a real sense of why people are, are concerned about this. And frankly, UAVs are a relatively easy technology for legislatures to be on the right side of the privacy issue, if you will, because it is so new and because it does foster so many concerns. Yeah. I've heard you uh, explain in the past, Kevin, we've discussed um, together how certain characteristics of geospatial data impact privacy in, in really unexpected ways. Can you describe for us um, how UAV collection of geospatial um, data could further impact privacy? Sure. So, um, you know, as, as most of the people on this call, I'm surely appreciate that one of the many benefits of geospatial information is that it is such a powerful visualization tool. However, all, that is also one of the concerns from a privacy standpoint. So as, as, as we have here on this slide, back in 2012, when a newspaper, New York newspaper published the addresses of registered gun owners in a particular county on a map, it caused quite an uproar. Uh, even though that information was, was generally publicly available, people seeing it on a map and being able, able to look, into their, uh, look at their neighbors and to see who had guns caused a lot of concerns about people for what the potential privacy issues were and actually led to, I believe, either an editor or a publisher of the paper being fired. So when you think about UAVs and people being in public spaces and, and why should they be concerned about privacy, if you start seeing that information being collected and then added to other geospatial data sets, you can see that people's responses are, are maybe quite different than you would expect. And we can, we can argue, we can take both sides of this issue with respect to whether this violates an individual's privacy or not by putting publicly available information on a map. But I think even having that discussion shows that when you, the, the impact of geospatial data and its potential, its relation to privacy concerns. Similarly, uh, uh, another issue, the similar issue is in New York at Long Island where a tax authority was trying to use imagery uh, 
to identify pools in the backyard of people that had, that had not been registered so they could collect taxes, assess it for tax purposes. And they eventually had to stop that because of media reports about privacy concerns associated with that, even though that information was publicly available on, on Google Earth and other sites. So putting that information out there and having people see it can cause some privacy concerns. Okay. Um, another concern about UAVs and privacy is the practice of surveillance. Um, our concerns about surveillance um, precede the application of UAVs and really stand distinct from UAV technology. Um, I mean, UAVs are just aptly suited for this one application. Can you give us a brief overview of surveillance activities today, um, some related, some not related to UAVs, and explain how they impact our sensibilities about privacy? Sure. So, so I think you're right. UAVs are definitely being caught up in the larger discussion of surveillance and, and Big Brother um, that, is, that is taking place right now. Uh, every day we're reading about new types of information that is or will be collected about us. Uh, in many instances, those include geospatial information, whether it be imagery or other types of location information. And this has a number of people concerned. And so when you have that discussion and people start thinking about UAVs, again, it becomes an easy target for people to, to worry about. However, I, what I don't think they often appreciate is that we have been giving our location information away to others you know, since the dawn of time, every time we go out into public, and we've done that without a second thought. Uh, information is collected on a location um, through cameras at stoplights, through CCTVs, smart tags, ATMs, point of sale transactions, and they're all creating this breadcrumb of location information. Now, that doesn't that doesn't necessarily mean that you know we should continue this or or should expand it. But I do think it adds to it. It should be brought into the discussion about the surveillance state, so that people can appreciate how the uh, the the different ways the data is collected and used, and not just for surveillance. And I'm not sure that's taking place. And one of the things that we can talk about later is perhaps the role of the geospatial community to help to help facilitate that or help to raise awareness on those things. Um, but right as we said, the concerns over surveillance states are, are growing. Certainly, there is more information that's being collected on a location, and when you and UAVs again are an easy target to sort of deal with that, even if it doesn't address all the other ways that location information is being collected. Okay, so most of these factors that we've been talking about, um, or these impacts on privacy, are more or less out of our control. Federal, state regulation. Certainly, we have. Hope we like to think we have some input on the direction of uh, state and federal um, regulations and legislation. But generally speaking, these are in, uh, out of our control. Uh, whether or not the city puts up a camera somewhere is out of our control. So um, if we're operating a business or, or, or perform a project in another state, we have no, we'll have no choice but to abide by the rules and regulations that govern unmanned um, aerial systems use. So understanding this technological and regulatory environment we find ourselves in today, can you recommend best practices that we can follow as potential operators of drones or as those who hope to benefit from their uh, commercial application to practice our craft safely and to mitigate risks associated with this you know, privacy environment we find ourselves in? Sure. So I think. I think first let's let's talk about something we've I've mentioned a couple times the the fair information practice principle. So, so my, most privacy constructs around the world are based upon these fair information practice principles. They were actually developed by a U.S. Uh, government committee to deal with concerns about computers and the information back in the I believe it was the 70s, uh, and they've been sort of evolved over time. There have been some modifications, but they're they were used at the OECD. They're used over in Asia. A lot of countries have tried to build those into the, into their legislation. And the elements of a fair information practice principle include notice and transparency, consent and use limitation, access, and, and the others that I've listed here. We can talk about those more in particular if you're interested in, in, in the question and answer period. I think, the, I think the issue becomes how does the fair information Principle practices apply. Practice principles apply to location, 
and, um, and remote sensing in general and UAVs in particular. And that's going to be the um, and that's going to be the real challenge. So it's really hard to say what are best practices right now because I, I think that that's that's it's a, maybe a little bit early to do that. But I, I can give you some suggestions based on trying to play the fair information practice principles. What other what legislation looks like? What other types of industries are doing? And and so these are sort of considerations for. For organizations that are in this in this field that are trying to trying to go out there and collect use UAV to collect, one is to is to just put an announce your plan to fly to UAV on on your website. Just make it clear where you're flying. Perhaps the sensor, the time, the flight line, maybe the altitude that you're going to be flying at, just to let people know, um, or so you can point them to them if there are any questions. You may also want to start considering to designate a point of contact for UA, from UAV privacy concerns, someone that people can call, someone who's up to speed on what it is that you're doing, what steps you're taking to protect privacy if you're worried about collecting that as your, as your information becomes more sensitive. Over time, you want to develop appropriate security around storage and access of your, of your UAV information. That is something that um, people are very concerned about not just in the UAV field, but in general about who has access to your information and how is it stored and how do you protect it. And if, if people start thinking that UAV imagery is sensitive to the extent that you can show that you're taking steps to protect it, the better off you'll be. I think training and education for your employees, anyone who might be touching the data will be increasingly important as well. Letting them know about the sensitivity and why it's important to protect the confidentiality of any information, what they should do if they find something that's, for instance, an emergency or they think violates someone's information. I think that's a good thing to consider. I think it's also important to start considering, you know, in your agreements with, with, other, with your customers or as you share data between organizations, maybe putting in your agreements that they're only going to use the data for the purposes for which it was collected that they won't use it to violate an individual's privacy or, or to conduct surveillance of a person or a place. Just some basic principles that may help you protect you going forward. And then the final thing is, and, and it's one that um, you know, most people don't think about, but you know, if, you are, if you are in this field as you start, as, as we, we're in a litigious society, it might be worthwhile to check with your insurance carrier to make sure that if you were brought into a lawsuit, whether your insurance would cover you. Back to the first uh, bullet on that slide, Kevin. Um, after we, or as we were uh, working with the FAA to establish the COAs here in Iowa to fly our UAVs, they had us uh, basically establish a communication plan as a best practice with all of the uh, uh, air traffic control towers of the area so that uh, before we went out to fly a mission, um, we were to call these uh, this key person at a tower so that um, all the towers would be aware of who's flying, what's flying, um, when will you be flying, and when will you be done flying. And uh, that was, just goes to inform everybody that needs to be informed and uh, I think is a, a real good practice. And it may, it, the FAA may require that going forward once the rules are released, but if not, it's still a good idea. Yeah, and I think I think that is a good idea, and I think there are some operational and safety concerns associated with why the FAA would want you to do that. I guess the the the, the what I'm thinking about, in, in addition to that, is maybe making it available on your website as to what you're going to do, and from a sensor standpoint, what information you're going to collect, just so that uh, people on the ground will have a sense that something's flying overhead. That you know they would know what it is, or um, you know who was who was flying it, and what it was being used for. I know you've got some uh, uh, thoughts too, Kevin. Um, I would just add to what you said as far as a something we can do today, and that is you know become an advocate, get involved, be heard. As geospatial professionals, we have a lot to contribute to this whole area of privacy and UAVs, so that you know, they can be used safely and responsibly and at the same time protect um, the privacy of, of folks. So we need to get involved with organizations like MAPS, um, like uh, the AUVSI, like uh, your Center for Spatial Law and Policy and other professional organizations we are 
uh, associated with to you know have this conversation with the right folks, other groups, whether they be legislators at our state or, or federal level or um, other privacy groups and um, advocate for you know sane geospatial understanding and application to this area of privacy. Yeah, I, I agree. I think it's important. There, there is a very strong privacy community that's out there. Uh, many of them have, you know, great intentions and are raising very important issues, but they don't have the breadth and scope of knowledge that the geospatial community about all the different ways that that UAVs can be used and all the different benefits associated with with geoinformation. And I think it's it's incumbent upon members of this community to learn the language of the privacy community. First of all, they have their own jargon, like everyone else does. Um, the fair information practice principles being an example of that. I think if you, you need to sort of understand the, where those are coming from to have an informed dialogue with the privacy advocates. But I, I, I do think that the dialogue and education are going to be a contributing factor to whatever you know, policies and laws and regulations do end up taking place. So I appreciate that. We're coming up uh, here to the end, Ed, but as much uh, news has been going around the country uh, in the last week or so, I've got one last question that maybe you can address for everyone, um, if you don't mind. That's the case of Raphael Perker, or commonly known as Traffy, that's been in the news last week. This is the private individual who operated a small unmanned system. I think it was a powered glider back in 2011 over the University of Virginia near Charlottesville for the purpose of shooting video and, and photography for compensation. So it was a commercial application. To make a long story short, the FAA fined him 10,000 bucks. Mr. Perker then challenged this fine and finally on the 6th of March, an administrative law judge with the NTSB, I think, struck down that fine. Since that time, the FAA has appealed that ruling and the judge has stayed the decision. So can you comment, Kevin, on the implications of this ruling for commercial operations of the U of UAS in the United States? I think some people initially reported that this, this meant that the FAA didn't have authority to regulate commercial use of, of UAVs. I think that's an overly broad statement. I think that the case uh, applies specifically to model aircraft and the, the ability under the rulemaking of the FAA to, to regulate that in terms of what they've done so far. And this particular judge, and, and I've, I've read the opinion and I've read what others have read about the opinion, and I agree with those who suggest. I think it's a, it's a well-reasoned and well-written opinion, but I think it can only be narrowly applied to the use of quote-unquote model, model aircraft and the FAA's abilities to use that, to, to regulate that or to prevent the use of, of commercial commercial uh, use of the, of those, so I, I think any broader implication would be would be a mistake. And there have been some cases you know, or examples even recently where the FAA has come back and um, gone after folks who have tried to use UAVs. Uh, I, I believe with classes of, of UAVs outside of this, and have prohibited people from doing it. The most recent that I saw was the Washington Nationals tried to use it down at their uh, spring training and I believe they got a, a, a request from the FAA, a very strong request to cease doing that. I think there was a, a UAV used in, in New York recently and there was some quite with respect to the building collapse and there was some concerns about that. So I don't think it can be, this case should be broadly applied to say the commercial use of UAVs is, is, is okay. But I, th I do think it, it sort of raises the bar for the FAA to get their act together to, um, you know, to do a better job of explaining what can and can't be done so that there, so there are, is more clear guidance. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, well with that I think we're ready to uh, um, uh, repeat some of the questions folks have asked us and uh, get um, our comments. So Amy, go ahead. Yes. Uh, thank you, gentlemen, for your informative presentation and sharing your knowledge with us. We'll now move on to some of uh, the audience's questions. The first one I had was, Hungary has just enacted a law requiring advanced permission for any 
photographs, including any person, identifiable or not, does this hyper privacy bode well for UAS photography elsewhere in the future? I hope not. <laughs> Wait, does that have any application? Or what are the chances that we'd be that um, require that kind of notification in a public space here in the United States, Kevin? Yeah, I don't. I can't imagine that um, we would get uh, the U.S. would get that far. Um, out in front. Uh, if you look at the U.S. responses, to, for instance, to the Google Street View cars and other cars that are collecting information on, on public streets, um, you know, we didn't have the same response here as that, that certain European countries and other countries did. So I, I, I'm familiar with the, the law that Hungary just passed. Uh, there are actually other countries, surprisingly, that, that, that have similar type laws. But I, I agree. I don't, I don't think here in the United States we would, we would, we would ever go that far. I know MAPS has uh, worked with state legis at least one state legislature around the country so far in the last 12 months or so, where they were um, introducing or wanted to introduce some legislation that basically said drones could not be used to collect photography, period. And you know we just simply had to remind them that we've been collecting photography over the whole state for 50 years and you know we need some kind of an exemption for that and and that language was changed so it's just uh, again just kind of a, a shared information on advocacy that that works in many cases it does it does Mike but part of what I'm concerned about is that the the legislation will be will be written in such a way that it's not clear whether it applies or not and people may not even notice it um, yeah. Now with UAVs, that's probably not the case because the the people who sponsor bills like to call their bills the UAV Privacy Act or, or something along those lines. But given you know the the lack of knowledge of technology in particular or in general and geospatial in particular, I think there is a concern that people will wake up one day in one jurisdiction and find that what they thought was an innocuous law has actually been interpreted to be quite restrictive on what they've been doing for years because the person who wrote it really didn't understand how the technology worked or what the business implications were. Uh, in fact, the Iowa Senate has been uh, debating some legislation that basically says uh, uh, UAVs cannot be used for surveillance activities without a warrant and it doesn't define surveillance and it's real easy for me to imagine somebody coming behind them saying, well, that means you can't take photographs for mapping purposes, and we got a problem. All right, great answers, guys. Next question, how does long-term collection from a drone differ from CCTV recording typically done in cities? Good question. Kevin, what do you think? Well, uh, this this goes back to um, one of the points we discussed earlier. Is it it depends on what you have in your mind when you consider a, a drone. Um, I I could see, for instance, that a, a drone that just circles above and that collects uh, that isn't focused on a on a particular uh, or, or that's focused on a particular spot or a very narrow spot may may not would be very similar to a uh, CCTV or a series of CCTVs. But you could also see a drone with, with various type of sensors um, flying at an altitude with video cameras and, and maybe face detection technology that or, or feeding into face, detect face detection technology that could be much more intrusive than a CCTV. So um, I think in general it's a, it's a fair question to ask and that gets to the point that we discussed in terms of our locations being collected on a regular basis. But I think that the power of, of UAVs is that they can be used in a lot of different ways. Whether, you know, whether they are or not will depend on a lot of factors, including cost and, and market value, but the potential is there. Yeah, and I guess the thought comes to me is we just need, you know, legislators and regulators need to understand these geospatial and technical issues 
um, because you know we've been photographing ourselves from all kinds of platforms forever, right? Since the first camera sprung wings back in the 40s. So CCTV or a camera on a drone, you know, it's just a different platform, and our laws need to make sense and apply equally well regardless of the platform or technology to protect privacy. Well, and I think I think the other point of the corollary to that is, Mike, that you know the the, the photographs as you described that we've been taking uh, for years. Uh, you know, the CCTV pictures are taken for you know primarily for security, right? And a, and, and so they've got a, a one purpose. They, be, they could probably be used for a couple other purposes as well, but the, the, the photographs that companies such as yourselves are taking have, can be used for a variety of purposes, many of them instrumental to economic development, to urban planning, to transportation, and you know, they, the, the legislatures need to, need to understand this and not just see drones as part of the surveillance society, for instance, or just for CCTVs, or just like CCTVs. All right, next question. In your opinion, how are companies such as Skybox Imaging, Planet Labs, and others who now have near real-time imaging and streaming video dealing with sim similar privacy issues as being discussed here? Well, this is, this is Kevin. I, 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 don't, I don't have any first-hand knowledge. Um, I don't I don't think that their technology yet in terms of, from what I understand about Planet Labs and, and um, Skyboxes, uh, their resolution and capabilities, while, while very good, I don't think it's yet crossed a threshold where most people would, would worry about privacy issues. Having said that, I think the, the, the general question is a good one, which is, when, are, when is satellite coverage so ubiquitous and at what resolution or scale does the privacy concern get to be raised? And, and that's, that's something, you know, I, I expect that, the, that, the, that industry will, will face in the, in the future. And, and that's, you know, that's one of the things that, one of the reasons for the, for the center is that, you know, these issues cut across technology platforms and, and legal domains. And, um, as, as we sort of converge on these things, I think everyone is going to be dealing with these issues at one point in the future. All right, great. Uh, should firms that lease land for extractive purposes, examples being forestry, mining, oil and gas, begin to write some sort of permission for UAV usage clause into their lease? Amy, can you can you repeat that a question again? I'm sorry. Sure. Some or sorry, should firms that lease land for extractive purposes, such as forestry, mining, oil and gas, begin to write some sort of permission for UAV usage clause into the lease? Huh, good question. I, by that, I assume they mean if you're if you're if you're leasing the land from if if you're a, if you're a leasing the land from another party and you want to be able to use UAVs to monitor your forest or, or your assets whatever they may be to include in your lease your permission permission from the landlord for you to do that i think that's a i think that's a great idea um, i i think you know I'm, it it should be enforceable between you and the landlord i'm not sure it gets you over the hump in some jurisdictions with respect to whether you are still allowed to, to fly a UAV over there, but it does get a, a hurdle out of the way. And um, so I, I would think that would become good practice. Okay. Great. And the last question I have here is, is it allowed in the U.S. to buy a drone and use it for scientific purposes? And then also the same question, is it also allowed in Europe? Basically, right now, the, the um, FAA um, allows any public entity to operate drones, not for commercial purposes, but for research purposes, um, 
a number of scientific purposes, for testing purposes, et cetera. So any public entity would be universities, uh, the military, sheriff's departments, uh, fire departments, you know, those kinds of public entities are allowed with certain restrictions. They've got to have a, a certificate of authorization or a COA. Uh, they've got to have an airworthiness airworthy certificate for the aircraft they're planning to use. You know, it has to be flown under 400 feet, et cetera, et cetera. But public entities are allowed to use UAVs today, but not um, any civil or commercial entities at this point. With respect to, to Europe, I, I I don't know the specifics of of Europe, but my understanding is that it is it is easier to get uh, permission or authority to to use UAVs in in most European countries than it is than the strict prohibition in the United States. Now, I believe I was just looking at this the other day. I believe there are some certification requirements, and there's still some. Um, there may be some training and other requirements, but I think it's a lot more, you know, permissive over there than it than it is here. But I, but you know, it would it would probably be worth before doing it. It would probably be worth looking at that particular country's, um, you know, laws and policies and, and making sure that you had all the required permits uh, and approvals. Okay. Thank you, Kevin. Yes. Yeah, thank you for the great uh, question and answer session. And thank you all for coming and attending.